and about two o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, we started getting rocket attacks, mortar attacks, and it was quite a surprise. Uh, we weren't expecting it. Coming up on today's podcast, an interview with a veteran of one of the worst battles of the Vietnam War, the Tet Offensive. It's January 30th, and this is The Hot Zone. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, I just am so fortunate to have a next door neighbor named Chris Thomas, who's a Vietnam vet that really saw some amazing action during the war. He was there during the 1968 Tet Offensive. And I went over and sat down in his living room and talked to him about it the other day. And I just want to show you the entire interview because it was that amazing. Check it out. The intelligence was that there was going to be a ceasefire and that we were going to relax over the holidays. Um, there was not going to be any activity. So we all stood down. Um, that's why we ended up taking this mission to go into Saigon to Hotel 3. And it was going to be a three-day stand down. I was kind of looking forward to going to the NCO club and getting pizza. And the next thing I know, you know, I'm scrambling around trying to find a bunker. Uh, much to my surprise, there were no bunkers. We were at Hotel 3, which was the heliport at Tonsonut Air Base. So the first thing I discover is I'm on the second floor of a, a hooch, a, you know, building, and I come off the second floor, I hit the deck, I'm looking for a bunker, no bunkers. So I go scrambling back into the building and the only place I can get low is actually in the shower. <laughs> There's a three inch um, area that protects you. I get underneath that and I'm trying to get as low as I can. And there were B-40 rockets hitting, mortars are hitting, it's just chaos. And we're scrambling around and we have no weapons because you have to turn in your weapons at that point. So it was very scary. And then daylight comes and the fighting has ceased at that point. And then I contact my buddies up at Quan Loy and they've had the same occurrence. They've been getting hit. Um, so all I wanted to do was get back in that Huey and I wanted to go back up country because I knew for me, the safest place was in the air in a Huey. So the next um, thing I know, there's a detail and we're trying to build bunkers because there's still incursions and there's still activity going on. You know, there's a lot of rockets coming in and it's very scary. Uh, and all I hear is that we're getting hit everywhere across the country. And for me, um, you know, again, it was just um, a lot of um, people getting hurt, a lot of people getting killed. Um, but I wanted out in backup country because I felt I'd be safer uh, back at Quan Loy. Um, so now we go back up country. And so we land and I see devastation. Helicopters have burnt to the ground. B-40 rockets have hit them. And they've just burnt. You know, mag magnesium alloy burns quick and fast. My hooch was uh, one over from one that got hit. And it was just burnt as well. Uh, a friend of mine was killed. Um, a rocket hit um, one of the footlockers we had there and all we could find were the handles because the rocket had destroyed the bunker. Shrapnel had taken him out. He had been laying on his, on his cot and it just took away his stomach, took away parts of his head and he was just killed. Uh, two guys were walking uh, right next to that hooch and one of them had a sucking chest wound killed him. The other guy just had shrapnel all over the place. And my other buddy said that they had been playing um, poker and uh, about seven o'clock at night is when they started taking in rockets. Um, and so the, the, the tent that we had over our hooch became a fog from the concussion and the shrapnel went through the tent. So when I saw my, my hooch, uh, the, the top of the tent was just filled with shrapnel holes um, and when it rained, you know, it didn't hold anything back. It just was a shower in the tent. So it was just a, uh, a scary thing to see that I had missed that explosion that it hit. But there were just rocket, you know, craters all over the base camp. And this is the 1st Infantry Division base camp. 
So fortunately, most of the guys, they were out in the jungle when we got hit there at Quan Loy. The fact that we were getting hit day in and day out was so different from what we'd experienced just two weeks prior to that. Because two weeks prior to that, if you were able to get a, you know, or experienced a mortar attack, it was kind of unusual. Because uh, we could sleep through those because you could hear the mortars coming and if they were going away from you, you just rolled back over and continued on with your night. If they were coming toward you, you would kind of listen to see which direction they were coming toward you. And if it was something really you felt was going to come at you, you'd crawl out and jump into your bunker. Why were you in Vietnam? What were you doing there? How long were you there? What did you do? Well, I arrived in country as a unit with the 187th Assault Helicopter Company. Uh, there were two air traffic controllers assigned to the unit. So initially, I did air traffic control work for the unit, but they ran out of gunners. And so at the beginning of that, they came over and they said, would you like to volunteer to be a gunner? And I said, sure. Uh, so I was a gunner when I wasn't doing my primary MOS. So I did that for about four or five months. Then I got reassigned to the 125th Air Traffic Control Company at Quan Loy, which was the 1st Infantry Division base camp. So there I was uh, assigned to run the airfield. Um, at that point I was an E-5 uh, and I had people working with me. Um, and then one day the um, Air Force showed up as combat air traffic controllers. And so with them, I'd go out in a 130 and we would conduct air assaults. Uh, we'd follow the pathfinders in and then we would do fast movers. Uh, we'd have 25th Infantry Division, 1st Infantry Division, and we would conduct uh, assaults. Um, so that part was kind of exciting and kind of fun. Um, I actually enjoyed it. And then as we got closer and closer to Tet, then things became a little more serious um, and for me because there was no way you could get away from it. Um, it got very intense. You know, it seemed like every mission that um, the 1st Infantry Division went on, the 25th Infantry Division went on, we were winning. You know, we were kicking their ass. And so it became, for me, uh, much of a surprise to see the news reports and you know, that we were losing. I never understood that, especially when I got back to the States and I was there for 30 days before I rotated over to Germany. So I was disillusioned about, you know, what was going on uh, with the population in the States, thinking that we were losing the war, when my view was we were winning. Did you feel like the media was um, biased when you came back and saw the news report? The, the media for me um, were lying about what accomplishments we had done the good we had done, how good the American fighting soldier was. Because um, I saw it firsthand. You know, I'd drop these guys off, I'd pick them back up, you know, I'd see what they had done, I'd hear the reports of what they had done. So to hear something different just didn't connect with me. I could not understand why they were saying what they were saying. Mm -hmm. How has your experience in Vietnam affected the rest of you? Well, to this day, um, you know, I, I distrust what government says about our military, about our relations politically. I try not to watch the news because it just infuriates me. In uh, June of 67, we were going on a, an assault. I was flying as a gunner. I uh, went into an LZ that was a cold LZ. And as we were coming out of the LZ, uh, we started taking fire and our helicopters started uh, taking hits and I had a, uh, a grazing wound to my uh, left shin bone. Um, you know, so I took a hit. Um, you know, we pulled out, you know, my crew chief came over, he attended to me. Um, we went back to the base camp, medics arrived, uh, they attended to the wound and that was it for me for the rest of the day. But it wasn't a wasn't a real serious wound, um, fortunately. Um, got a little scar to prove it, but you know, other than that, it was just a, a day in the life of flying. Well, I'm an army brat, so I was expected to enlist. Um, my dad uh, was 82nd Airborne, yeah, CIB, World War II, Korea. Um, followed me into Vietnam after I rotated out, so I was expected to go into the military. 
I was 21 when I rotated out of Vietnam. So uh, I felt it was my um, appropriate thing to do. Uh, I felt I was a patriot, proud of my service, still am, but it affected me throughout my entire career. Um, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Uh, went through a lot of jobs, went through uh, a couple wives. Um, so there are those haunting things that still crop up. Still wouldn't, um, wouldn't give you know, a dollar not to have done it. You know, I would do it again if given the chance. Yeah, it's, a, it's the adventure of your life. Right? It was, yeah. still is. Yeah. You know, it paid for my college. Uh, it got me through flight school. Um, so I can't say enough about the GI Bill. You know, that was the, the best thing I liked about the, the experience with the military. No, it was always fear, but you suppressed it. Because, you know, what are you gonna do? You can't run. We took some veterans of the Tet Offensive back to Vietnam, and last year we released a documentary about the 50th anniversary of the Tet Offensive. And I highly recommend you go watch it. It's on NRA TV. Just look up Frontlines Tet 50 Years Later or you can find it on YouTube. Anyway, it's a great piece. I'm gonna leave you with a little trailer about it right now. Other than that, thanks for watching and thanks for being here on The Hot Zone. It was business as usual and, and all of a sudden the sky opened up, incoming. It was raining on our battery. We woke up in the morning with huge amounts of activity, noise, confusion. There was huge activity up around Hue. Nobody really knew what was going on. How would you assess the enemy's uh, purposes yesterday and today? The enemy uh, very deceitfully has taken advantage of the Tet Truce in order to create maximum consternation within uh, South Vietnam, uh, particularly in the populated areas. This was happening all over the, you know, the defensive lines throughout the entire area. We were under a rocket motor attack from at least three sides. It's chaos. I mean, you're trying to resupply the guns, you're trying to take the casualties out of the gun pits, but it was controlled chaos. The kids knew what the hell they had to do. I asked the Lord not to protect me. I just asked him not to let me let down my Marines. So I just went forward knowing that I've got to go as long as I can, as hard as I can, because the battalion was counting on Delta Company to do that. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.